November the 18th, 2023. I'm going to be your host, I'm Dana Drumford. The nuclear proctologist.org. And so there's a lot of questions about Gaza and Israel that remains unanswered. And an Israeli soldier on on November on October the seventh, when this all started, uh, I put out a video and I asked some Extraordinary questions. We'll just play those clips. They're self-explanatory. My apologies. October 7th, 2023. This is Afat Fenningson, and I'm here to share an update from Israel-Hamas war, which started this morning. I'm going to share some key details and concerns mostly based on Israeli citizens' voices from the ground and based on official statements. This is a very tough day for me and for us in Israel, and it is tough for people of Palestine too, especially now that Israel is starting to attack back. This war and every war is a horrible thing for everyone involved, except for those who get rich from it, right? Indeed. And so Israel fired around uh, 6,000 airstrikes in the first week. Gaza, Gaza doesn't have any jet fighters. They've got uh, tanks. And Israel has around 4,000 plus tanks. They have Ameri two American aircraft carriers off the coastline. They have British... Uh, destroyers off the coastline. Uh, they have 350,000 uh, well-equipped uh, military versus Hamas's 10,000. Now, what Hamas done was despicable, unforgivable, uh, unimaginable, inconceivable, and in more ways than one. And this Israeli soldier is going to ask that question of how could Hamas ever breach the walls. A year ago, there was a military operation in Gaza to prepare for such events, and ongoingly there are trainings for these kind of scenarios. This raises serious questions for me, anyway, about Israeli intelligence. What happened? Two years ago, there, were, um, there was a successful deployment of underground barriers with sensors to alert exactly on these kind of terrorist breaches. Israel has one of the most advanced and high-tech armies. How come there was zero response to the border and fence breaching? I cannot understand that. Personally, I served in the IDF 25 years ago in the intelligence forces. There's no way, in my view, that Israel did not know of what's coming. A cat moving alongside the fence is triggering all forces. So this? What happened to the strongest army in the world? How come border crossings were wide open? Something is very wrong here. Something is very strange. This chain of events is very unusual and not typical for the Israeli defense system. So to me, this surprise attack seems like a planned operation on all fronts. This is a failure to protect the people of Israel, for sure. Perhaps the biggest failure since the Yom Kippur War exactly 50 years ago, if not bigger. By the way, is it a coincidence it's exactly 50 years ago, almost on the day? The Yom Kippur War was on October 6, 1973. If I was a conspiracy theorist, I would say that this feels like the work of the deep state. It feels like the people of Israel and the people of Palestine have been sold once again to the higher powers that be. At the same time, this is still very, very difficult to fathom. Have a good evening. So that's a question that all Israelis, all pro-Israelis need to ask. Doesn't matter what side you're on, that's the question that needs to be asked. That's the most important question. And there's just a lot of carnage on both sides. My heart goes out to everybody. Uh, but we still got to ask these hard questions. And, and 
Remember, that was on October the 7th. That's the day that it all happened. And that they got her, inf her information. She's a journalist, too, ex IDF, or IDF soldier. But that's report she got from Ground Zero was there was no resistance. Israel didn't show up. Now, there is some evidence later on when they finally showed up, and it's quite shocking. Uh, Israel Post illustrations showing all Palestine territories as part of Israel. This was the official social media account for the state of Israel. And they showed Gaza didn't, Palestine didn't exist. It was all Israeli. No West Banks, no nothing. Um, okay, so let's go back in time. And you can see how it played out from 1948, how Israel slowly but constantly used violence to take the majority of the land of their neighbors. And so they acted as a parasite and a plague, and they caused nothing but misery. You're seeing incredible misery. And you're talking about 5.5 million refugees and brings us up to 2023. And so 2023, they are gone all out there. Just in the first few weeks, they used the same amount of ordnance munitions as several large uh, Nagasaki bombs worth of damage. Uh, but the reality of it was it was a lot because you were only counting airplanes. They got over 4,000 tanks, and then they have all kinds of artillery, and the list is very long. So there was an update from this journalist from Israel who had now gotten a lot more information and was sharing it. And I, and I was said to myself that, you know, with all the, the divide and controversies going on, we really do need somebody honest, and we do need somebody from ground zero to tell the story, and this is what we have. When I saw there. the attacks, my first thought, literally, was, how is this even possible on that border that it could be breached by so many people simultaneously? One, one would have expected, if it, an attack had been successful, that the number of people who got through initially would have been small. You know, if five people had gotten through out of a a, 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 a military force of a hundred and had done some damage, that would certainly be noteworthy and would be considered an embarrassing failure for the IDF and the security services of Israel. But to have hundreds get through and operate um, barely impeded for was it a full day almost this seems like it is not if, if somebody submitted it as a script you would say that is implausible and so it did lead me to wonder what could possibly explain such a failure incompetence seems inadequate And so the, the argument that we're running into with any dissenting voices is repeated, I noticed, constantly for the last, since October the 7th. And here's a good example. A Jewish family blast the Minneapolis teacher union statement on Israel is dangerous to our children. But the, the argument was the same argument that we're hearing constantly from all over the world for the pro-Israelis. Uh, was that the teachers ignored the Hamas terrorist attack on October the 7th. How can you ignore it when that was the catalyst? But that's the argument we're hearing, and that's why they're... Sh they're pushing back at whoever is denouncing Israel's overhand. He fails to mention 240 hostages still held in Gaza. And you literally got to start off every conversation was there was 1,200 
dead Israelis and 240 hostages. Otherwise, that's used to um, as a distraction away from the narrative that she had. So there's no counter argument. They come out with this, and it's basically a smear. Well, how come you didn't mention October the seventh? Well, of course, but everybody knows it happened. Anybody that's into the conversation is well aware that actually happened. But that's the narrative we're seeing, instead of an actual debate. It's, well, you didn't mention the hostages. And there's over 5,000 Palestinian children killed. It's children, like your children that are in that school, were killed. And so is your children more important than, than those children? Does your children live in houses that looks like this? That's what I say. Okay, so... Israeli, you know, uh, I'm sorry, let me get back on track here. Go back to 2014, here's a Israeli soldier bragging they killed 13 Palestinian kids, not 13 Hamas, not 13 he uh, Hezbollah, but 13 Palestinian children. It sure looks like they're targeting children. But Dana, you didn't mention the 1,200, you know, killed by Hamas, and then you didn't mention the 240 people that were kidnapped. And we'll kill every Palestinian children if that's what it takes for us to get our 240 back. And that attitude, you can see where it comes from, right? So, you, like, it's we're we're trying to have a conversation, and nobody's willing to have the conversation. There's always this, just. Who are you to talk about anything kind of attitude? But they're entitled to talk about whatever they want, but you're not allowed to talk about anything. Only they are allowed to talk, and, and they being the pro-military-industrial complex, no doubt. So this journalist all of a sudden is asking again, this is after, the, the, she already done it on October 7th herself. Now she's back, in, and she's much more articulate, and she's able to explain the ludicrousness of this now that she has all this documentation as a journalist. It's well worth your listening. To explain it. Now, you're in a position to say more about this because you have you have manned that border. Yeah. It's very hard for me to talk about it because it's... Um, <laughs> there are so many friends and family members of friends that are missing and have been taken hostage in this barbar barbaric act, that talking about what I know feels like, sometimes feels like, why is this important now? And at the same time, I know that if we don't talk about this, then we will just let them off the hook once again. Because to me, and, and I will explain why I think this this is a great atrocity um, because to me this is it's I don't know how to say it it's just the people of Israel have been I don't know if sacrifice is a too rough of a word but we have been sold and sold, uh, out. sold out completely and uh, no help for hours and hours and no military involvement, no police, no arms on the ground for hours and hours. This is something that is non-typical and unusual for Israel Defense Forces. Now, I've served in the military forces 25 years ago as uh, I was in the intelligence uh, forces uh, based in the Gaza Strip, as I told you. And I know the security drills. When I served, there was no internet. So I would sit next to the phone in my uh, shift of the fence of the security of the Gaza Strip. And whenever something would move alongside the fence, I would get a phone call from the human observers that are looking at the gate um, telling us there is a chain of command that you have to notify when something like this happens. And then straight away, uh, forces come in 
to look at what is it and take it down. So what do you mean when something moves by the fence? How small it can, is something? It can be a pig. It can be a cat moving alongside the fence or touching the fence or trying to cross the fence. An animal, they would identify it. They would see it. There so are a cat, human, a cat gets scrutiny. would trigger. Yeah, it could trigger the fence. Yeah. And An animal. 25 years later with And 25 years sensors, later with internet and with the most sophisticated high-tech weaponry systems like drones, like there is a special system, I don't know how to call it in English, uh, it's called uh, seeing shooting. That's a literal translation from Hebrew to, to English, seeing shooting. It's a robot that sits on top of a, of a um, uh, tower looking, looking at the fence and whenever something triggers the fence which has sensors on it, it's supposed to shoot. It's like automatic, right? And and there are drones and there are helicopters and there are troopers on the ground. And, you know, there are many things that are supposed to be activated. There are various lines of defense and layers of defense that are supposed to be activated when something like that happens. Okay, so... Uh, so, there's 15 places or more where Hamas came through the fence, and yet there was no response from the military. So that's known as a false flag, right? Uh, I'll show you a bunch of examples of them in a one-minute clip that I put together with pictures to make it. And it's by Patrick Claussen, which is an Israeli think tank, doing a presentation at the Washington Institute. And I'm usually pretty good at finding that until I really, really need it. Yes, that'll be Patrick. And so I shortened the clip down, but how do you get to war with Iran was the basic theme of it. And how did we get all the other wars? And how did Israel just get to war? Because they're suggesting it's the false flag and by what they call deep state, right? I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall he had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing, which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. It would be best if somebody else started the war. And that's what they're talking about. They allowed Hamas to come in. There was no way they didn't know Hamas was going to come in. Uh, there's evidence showed up twice, and one of them was recent. It was today, I believe, or yesterday, of the Hannibal Directive. And th so this is where they killed their own people so they can't be taken hostage and then hold his ransom against the country. And it's, I think in Israel, it's, don't quote me, but I believe it's called the Hannibal Directive. Israel forces killed many of the Israeli citizens who died during a Hamas-led resistance surprise attack on Gaza. There was no surprise attack because, now remember, this Israel... All the medias, before Israel even had a chance to say anything public, all the mainstream media was like, this is Israel's 911. <laughs> that narrative disappeared, I noticed, over the last three weeks. Uh, but it was, it was said in the main media hundreds and hundreds of times in the first few days. It was quite, quite frightening narrative. Hamas claims it targeted Israeli soldiers, not civilians. So there was a lot of confusion 
But then there was a lot of evidence and of suggesting that the Hannibal Directive was carried out where they actually killed their own citizens and soldiers rather than have them taken hostage. Right? And But obviously they weren't part of the original response because there was no original response. Everybody stood down. And so these soldiers probably said, well, I'm not standing down. I'm not letting these people down. I didn't join the military or get conscripted into the military to sit in silence, right? And I have footage there to back it up, but I can't authenticate it, so I'm not going to use it. Uh, but I'm, I'm assuming it's real, but I'm not familiar with the territory to make that definition final. Israeli army was behind many settlers' deaths during the initial Hamas attack. And again, they call it a surprise attack, but Israel has never been surprised. Israel admits burning hundreds of people. The question is, who burnt them? And this is Mark, and anybody who knows this narrative, I've been doing this for over 20 years, uh, following this tragic stories, and there's many of these stories worldwide. We've covered many of them back in those days, right? But this one was is an exceptional story when you look at the bigger picture. So there was a, so originally it was 1,400 Israeli people died, right? They revised that down to 1,200 because around 200 was so badly burnt they couldn't tell originally who they were, right? But it turned out these were Hamas, they said. So did Hamas incinerate themselves? No, of course not. And Hamas wasn't carrying. They were driving trucks and motorcycles and paragliders. Israel got jet fighters and drones and helicopters and uh, every gadget you can imagine. So if you go read that story and you go read this story, that's what you're going to read is that there's strong evidence suggesting Israel killed some of their own, which I think was a breakaway from the false flag, the deep state that was working in the background. Okay. Israel is using food and water as a weapon of war against the civilian population. 1.6 million people now out of 2.2 million people. Uh, it's 100% genocide, obviously, and this was planned. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, of course, has been, he's uh, linked up with the Likud, the ultra Orthodox Jews, we call the headbangers. They study the Torah and the Talmud. They don't contribute to society. The Israeli, 5 million Israeli citizens, they support uh, almost 2 million Orthodox Jews. And their job is to promote the Torah and the Talmud's version of Jerusalem. Their God's chosen ones. Jerusalem is, is the sacred ground. And they don't want anybody else there on the... Uh, Israelis. So a couple of days ago, they blew up the parliament building. As you can see, it's already destroyed, but now they just yeah. finish it off. There was uh, 300,000 Israelis. 300,000 Israelis supporters just marched in the United States. <clears throat> I wonder why they... None of them acknowledge stuff like this. I mean, Israeli soldiers, they're targeting kids. That's, that's what he's doing. He's targeting kids. He's not targeting Hamas. They're targeting kids. And they're so blatant about it, they put it up on an Instagram account. So obviously this was acceptable behavior, right? And so but and what we're seeing, right, was this trending of escalation of more and more blatant contempt, right? So it's, it's not a war against Hamas. Hamas, there was around 10,000 Hamas. And they got 5.5 million refugees. So they got no problem keeping 5.5 million refugees out, period. None of them breached the wall, but they can't control. And we noticed this for the entire amount of Iranian terrorist group Hamas has been sitting in power. This is uh, one of the universities. Yeah. 
This one of the bigger universities, they flatten it. But to look at these bombs they're using, my goodness. Palestine doesn't has never used this type of weapon. Palestine throws rocks. Israel throws Nagasaki bombs worth every week of munitions. And they're using they're using American one fifty five depleted uranium munitions. Cause um Zelensky in Ukraine is upset, who's fired over two million of them so far, by the way. And they usually fire about a quarter million a month of those 155. So Israel is getting down. How many How many of these are the tanks, the 4,000 tanks firing, is, is, and the artillery guns firing each day? Because you only get numbers from the jets, and they're frightening. <clears throat> Israel hunts through hospital. There was nothing. There's nothing sacred. There. They drove thousands of people out of the buildings and didn't get any Hamas. And these are people that are already destroyed by them. They're starving. They got no water. They got no food. It's been collective punishment, land, sea, and air embargoes. And they just decided Netanyahu decided he's never going to get another term. And so he's he's hooked up with all the Orthodox Jews, and they're just going to ram their vision through, right? They're going to create the fictional Bible. The world turns against Israel. God comes down and destroys the world, and only the people in Jerusalem. And it doesn't matter what religion you're, but only the people in Jerusalem go to heaven. That's that's their Torah and Talmud, right? They're God's chosen people. <clears throat> and they don't care about anything else. They just care about their version of the Bible. And they've been encouraged to do it. And that's what the other five million Israelis are. They're going into the West Bank and they're spraying the Palestinian houses with what they call scum trucks. And personally, I think all the Palestinians should never have a story of David. Israel should never complain about the Palestinian they, they just barbarized people. Seven million people for goodness sakes in the seven years. And now they pull the false flag and they're going to use that as justification to destroy the most vulnerable population. France calls the West Bank Israeli settlers' violence a policy of terror. It's a policy of terror, is an understatement. <clears throat> and anybody out there knows that's in this conversation knows that's true. The authority doxy Jew don't care about nobody. And the damage done at the music festival strongly suggests that the authority doxy Jews knew this was going to happen and took advantage of it. Because there was a frenzy, an absolute frenzy. They took the time, they had tons of time, barely any resistance, only that was actually there at the site itself, but there was nothing new came along and, and engaged them and stopped them. They took hostages back there with them, right? But there is evidence to suggest that the ultra-Orthodox Jews were dressed up as the medics and participated in the carnage. There's... This was a false flag. They wanted the violence. They wanted the heartbreak. And a lot of these people weren't from Israel. They, they traveled to Israel, and they were at their party. And it was like they threw the party just for that to happen, if you look a little deeper. Like the journalist from Israel, he said, this is the big hand of the deep state. Palestinians, I think there's around 60,000 of them working in Israel with menial jobs, were tagged like lab rats, and they were very <coughs> abused. They were very trusted. They came in and done all kinds of menial work for the big shots in Israel. And then, um, and then they were treated literally as lab rats. And so obviously they're never going to be welcomed back again. And in fact, Israel is contracting, trying to contract with India, 120,000 workers. The majority of these people uh, were construction. So that's the worst job you can take. Here you were uh, in an apartheid 
environment where 5.5 million refugees from your own country and living in squalors for many decades and you're going to take a job in Israel to help build Israel to be bigger and stronger. It's an insane statement. And anybody that questions Israel at Harvard and Yale and MIT or Berkeley are being dosed by trucks with TV screens on them with their pictures and faces, their future employees are being uh, sent their names and warned never to hire these people because the universities, uh, remember how powerful the university, and there's this absolutely onslaught, we've covered it. <laughs> they just broke the, the glass in the back of the pickup truck that was putting people's faces up and sitting out front and calling him anti-Semitic for trying to have a conversation, trying to ask a question. They don't want anybody asking questions because you're going to run in to these answers at some point. You're going to ask the question, well, how come you didn't stop Hamas from coming in? And how come you didn't stop them from being captured and leaving? And I mean, they're asking that question, aren't they? All criticism of Israel is not inherently anti-Semitic. This is from a Jewish writer. We condemn the recent attack on Israel and the Palestinian civilians and mourn such harrowing loss of life. And in our grief, we are horrified to see the fight against anti-Semitism weaponized as a pretext for war crimes with stated genocidal intent stated genocidal intent and using Jewish suffering to erase the Palestinians experience but one of the most hideous things is these bulldozers and I got videos of them running over Palestinians I'm not going to play them obviously but they're just going in and plowing down the infrastructure of the homes and here's the Palestinians throwing <laughs> Israeli shooting. So, like, when you think of that mindset, when you think of that mindset where they're driving these pieces of equipment around the city streets, just taking down and destroying, it's like like they're destroying the infrastructure. <coughs> and they're just methodic. There's no resistance. There's no jet fighting back. There's no jets they got to worry about going to shoot them, right? There's no drones flying around that's going to wipe them off the mat like Israel got. The, the Palestinians doesn't have 4,000 tanks which would drop those things in a heartbeat. And, and it, the Palestinians don't have 350,000 well-armed soldiers connected to jets and artillery and Navy ships and everything else, right? Satellites and you name it. There's going to be no helicopters coming to rescue the Palestinians when they're wounded, but there is for the Israelis. And they're conscripted, so they're very vulnerable children that are fighting. These are children that the, the military uses, right? The majority of them not even old enough to vote or buy cigarettes or alcohol, and that's who the soldiers are. And they're, they just get bum-rushed into it. Their parents done it. Their brothers and sisters, siblings done it. Their aunts and uncles participated in it. And so when you get this many generations after... 75 years, of, right? Everybody, their loved ones, their parents, both parents, everybody participated in the military. This is natural. They're the four, and the fourth biggest weapons producer on the planet. But they've never fought a real 
war, right? Israel's never fought a real war, right? The the Six Day Yom Kippur War wasn't a real war either. In America was right there. <coughs> they never f like Palestine is not a war. Gaza is not a war. That's not a war. If they had four thousand tanks firing back at them, if there was a navy that is is equal to them, if there was an air force equal to them. Israel wouldn't be there. They're only there because there is no functional resistance. Throwing rocks against these tanks is not resistance. And so here's an Israeli soldier and a journalist asking you some pretty important questions and everybody else on this planet, the actual most important questions. I just want to make this clear. I mean, it probably is, but you have a system that is sensitive to anything the size of a cat or bigger. That system, since you were uh, manning it, has had 25 years to mature and become more sensitive, to become more discerning. And yet, how many places was that border breached? 15. 15 places. It's not more, uh, yeah. 15 and that is completely ridiculous because normally with one breach of the fence the whole army is triggered and things start moving sure. immediately things start moving immediately and here there was nothing for hours and so i was i want to talk <laughs> Because every single child in Gaza is living exactly what I am living right now with my family. There is no electricity, there is no internet, there is no water, there is no food. Basically, my home doesn't feel like home anymore. Okay? We are the victims here. We are human beings. We deserve to live. 